Good morning. Hello, everybody. I'm Sarah Beth Burke, and this is my LinkedIn live show, Becoming More Than Your Title. Now, that expression means something to me because I feel I'm more than a job title. And I meet so many people that are in the same position where they're like, my title doesn't really describe who I am and what I do. I'm not just a strategist or a leadership coach or a consultant. And this predicament of people being more than their titles is what I study. I'm actually a researcher of hybrid professionals. Now that term hybrid professionals is a new way to think about the workforce because typically we've had this binary of either being an expert or a generalist. But there are people that are moving somewhere in between where they actually are intersecting and combining multiple identities into some new hybrid version. We don't even know what to call that. So my guest today is amazing. Her name is Precious Stroud, and I'm so excited to hear her story because a lot of my work has to do with intersectionality. And intersectionality typically comes from diversity studies, race and class and gender all combine in our humanity and have to do with our background and oppression and privilege. Well, I took that concept of intersectionality and thought, can we have that just in the professional side of our life? In my own case, I'm an artist and a researcher and an educator and a designer. How do all those pieces fit together? Because I'm not just one at a time. Well, in the intersection of those four identities is my hybrid professional identity. So Precious has this amazing background where she's taking marketing and changing narrative and shifting all kinds of work for women and women of color. And there's so much within her background story. So we're gonna dig into that and how she sees herself. And I'm gonna bring her up, we're gonna get going. Hi, Precious. Welcome. Thank you, Sarah Beth. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm thrilled. You and I were on a platform called Elevate Together. We were presenters and I loved hearing your story. And then you said you'd be a guest. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is great. Thank you. It's, an, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm so excited about becoming more than your title. Yeah, let's dig into that. So Precious, I always start by asking people, what do you do? Because that's just kind of the standard, but also it's part of my research work. So I'm gonna throw that to you to get started. Tell us, what do you do? Sure, so I, my big vision is to restore humanity in marketing and doing that through helping organizations and individuals tell their stories in compelling ways to the right people at the right time. Oh, so succinct. Give us a little more background. How did you get into sure. that? Because you're you're bringing humanity and marketing together. I've never heard about that before. Mm -hmm. So it was really I I started in marketing and actually started in technology public relations. Like my first job was in Palo Alto, California. My first job after college, and I had the the real beauty of working for a uh, a firm, an organization that had a woman CEO. Mm -hmm. And it, she was one of the four in the Valley at the time. It was really, really um, a unique experience because nothing else in my career was that way. Mm -hmm. So whereas we were able to talk about women in this really positive light, and there were lots of women leaders in our organization, um, in the marketing, in the in PR and in marketing related to tech, we just weren't seeing many voices. Yeah. And so that was probably the beginning of this question around, well, is the is marketing really telling the truth mm -hmm. now some might say was it ever intended to my <laughs> argument is that um every single person deserves to be seen in their full humanity mm -hmm. and that when we cannot use marketing as a way to diminish people oh so that's the humanity part so whether it's nonprofit, public service um corporate we have a choice yeah and i'm choosing that that humanity should be maintained that is a powerful message. And it sounds yeah. like you've got some deep core values baked into that. Tell me about these different identities in your work that you're bringing to the table. And then we're going to get into the hybridity of that. Mm -hmm. So I started, well, currently, so I have a 
consulting firm that focuses on marketing and communications. No surprise there. And out of that work, we thought, well, maybe we need a demonstration project. It was really a passion project called Black Female Project, and it became a whole nonprofit. So now I'm the founding executive director of a nonprofit organization, as well as um, the owner founder of this uh, small and growing business, neither of which are a nice fit into any world in particular. And so there's a lot of learning and a lot of curiosity that keeps me going. That is fascinating. I love how you described it as a passion project, the black female project that now has turned into its own thing. And so you've got these two massive bodies of your professional work on the table. How do you navigate that? What does that feel like? Do you feel you have to compartmentalize or do you get to move and change what you're doing across the two areas? Yeah, I really do appreciate that question. So it, it does take me back to when I was my first job out of college, I worked for a woman, shout out to Liz Franklin in the world. She was um, the first person who hired me in her home office and she was an author and a speaker mm -hmm. and she had clients. So I thought, you know, oh, I'm supposed to have clients. So all through college, even though I had part-time jobs, I also had clients. Mm -hmm. And so throughout my career, I kind of had always had clients. So now here I am, I'm like, okay, well, what if I just stop saying no to my clients and I do this full time? So I left my nine to five about seven years ago mm. and started building this, which I, I did not know what I was, I thought I was just becoming independent. Yeah. And then, um, oh, there was another touch point that also kind of leads me to this point is I'm, uh, so I also am a musician because that's fun, right? So mm -hmm. um, all of these things just would come together in really weird ways. For example, I was um, young-ish and uh, divorcing and got a nine to five because that's what I was supposed to do, take care of myself. And all of a sudden I was like, I think I need to join orchestra. Ooh. Like, why would I need to go to the civic orchestra? But I did, and it was because that part of me needed the nurturing. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, it's about what are those elements of myself that need nurturing and not, not denying them, even if it's within the professional realm. I love that you just said that, got major body chills, because that is so quintessential of hybrid professionals. Mm. The core identities in your work that are so necessary to you have to be fed. And when we deny them, ignore them, push them off, we eventually become frustrated and we have to gravitate to something that allows that part to come back in. And you just explained mm -hmm. that so well, like, why would you join an orchestra? But you were like, this is me. This has to come mm -hmm. out and it has to be part of what I do. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah. So how did that feel when you were able to access and sort of let yourself be that other part that had been denied? It felt liberating in the midst of all of this change mm -hmm. and transformation that was happening in my life. It felt like home in so many ways mm -hmm. from the practicing to going to set up, literally set up and set like, you know, set up all the things that have to be set up when you're playing an orchestra. And yeah. um, as I think about that right now, just the elements, you said the elements, what does it mean for me now to build a team, to build a team on the nonprofit side, to building a team on the other side and transferring some of these values and thoughts I have about how do we engage as service providers to people who we have values alignment related to their missions. Yeah. So a lot of our work is in the public service sector um, because I also then eventually went from technology into higher ed <laughs> and then to supporting K-12 schools. So a lot of our contacts were in the education field. And so we did a lot of work mm -hmm. the first five years around narrative change initiatives in public service organizations. And so we, as bringing other people on, they either had to have some affinity or have some aligned values there. And then we had to teach what our culture was. And mm. all of that was new for me. We had a virtual team, which gave us a little bit of a head start last year. But as the world changed, um, we doubled down on wow. how can we build more cohesion so that we're ready when this is all. Yeah elevating or changing. These are the moments when voices that were not heard before get heard. So how do we position ourselves and our clients for that? Yeah, you're at the crest of the wave, just helping bring people that didn't realize yeah. they needed this. What a powerful place and good for you for seizing that opportunity. Thank you. Um, 
I'm, I want to come back to this term you used, narrative change, right? Because it's a little unfamiliar to me, but I, I can get a sense of it. And just mm -hmm. to give a little framing around why I'm curious, I use the Venn diagram a lot to help people mm -hmm. understand intersectionality. And so the different parts of your professional identity I'm hearing are, you know, Precious the musician and the marketer and the humanitarian. And mm -hmm. maybe you have others you would use, but I'll just play with that. Mm -hmm. And when those intersect, in the middle of those three, I'm hearing you are this narrative change agent, right? You are helping people tell stories with truth and honesty and values. Would you agree with that and, and expand upon that if you would? Yeah. I really, uh, I would agree with that. And uh, Sarah Beth, I really, I, I've wrestled with that term for a long time. I do mm -hmm. think it's an insider game term um, mm -hmm. related to nonprofits and I have landed on storyteller. Okay. But I do think the term narrative change or narrative shifting is really about we've had these mainstream narratives or even narratives that were niche that were not serving well. Yeah. And that perpetuates status quo thinking. Yeah. The background to this is it really lands. So um the there's also an asset framing concept model an asset-based frame around telling stories and narratives, whether it's in journalism, movies. And the person who I've studied with is Trabian Shorters of BME mm -hmm. Community. Okay. And um, in terms of, he introduced me and tons of other marketing professionals and philanthropists and many other people to this concept of asset framing that is grounded in the research of Daniel Kahneman. So mm -hmm. his research of the brain, how the brain works that and this is my interpretation, is that uh, we aren't as thoughtful as we'd like to think. We actually just draw from the story bank that exists in our yeah. heads. Mm. Well, I don't know if it really exists in our heads, but right, like all these stories that we have. Yeah. So if all the stories are perpetuating a certain narrative thought, feeling, et cetera, yeah. then it isn't up to us to change people's minds. It's up to us to offer more stories Ooh. Ooh. or for the individual to seek out other stories. I love that. So that's where, when we talk about narrative change, we're really talking about multiplying the amount of positive narrative stories out there so that people have a choice. Oh, thanks for clarifying. And I love, mm -hmm. I can see that frame of storyteller as a more powerful way to put it than just the narrative change agent. And, and that's why I'm curious about hybrids, right? Because it's like, what do we call ourselves when we're doing these things? So yes. have, have you ever heard the term hybrid professional before we met? No. So I when I when you were talking, because we met at the Elevate thing, uh -huh. and um, when you were talking about it, I thought, oh my God, there's a name for this? Finally, there's a <laughs> landing place because who in the world does these things? Mm -hmm. And then people say, so in the midst of all that, um, working my way through college, having the clients, I also was a wedding coordinator because why oh. not? Yeah, why right. Not? <laughs> um, and I just appreciate having a, a container mm -hmm. and knowing that there's research and also knowing that there's probably a whole lot I could learn from people who have done this longer, smarter, faster, <laughs> um, because I find myself with much tension between mm -hmm. the expectations of a nonprofit leader right. from an entrepreneur. Like that is a stretch. Uh huh. So um, I know about that. tell me about that tension. Um, well, you know, um, there have been I'll, I'll give the nonprofit sector. I'll say philanthropy is changing mm -hmm. as we speak. Yeah. And there are expectations of what a nonprofit executive will do, how they behave, what the rules are. Now, the rules have to change because it has been exclusionary and in many ways, but also we as practitioners have to change mm -hmm. and not be like, I need not be pressured by the status quo in that field, but it's so intense. Yeah, Like this is what executives do, this is how you build a board. And maybe that's mm -hmm. true, but we need space for humans here. And oh. I need space for the dynamic nature of people. Yeah. And it doesn't always lend, lend itself to that. Whereas on the other side with entrepreneurship is like, figure it out by yeah. any way possible and get creative and, and break through all the barriers. So I have this one house on my, in, in this where I'm working right now that feels very structured mm. and another house where it's like, you have to leave every structure behind. Wow. And that is the tension right now. And there's so much learning. 
Mm. And how are you noticing your different professional identities becoming assets in this learning moment? Mm, well, okay, so that's that obviously made me very excited. So <laughs> I I have never I never really thought about it in this manner. So I have I think the creativity is obviously coming through the determination that there are other ways, not the only way. That is very helpful. Um, I have a amazing group of people around me, friends, family, and team members, um, people who I work with every day who remind me that we're here to tell the truth, mm -hmm. not to do anything else. And that that truth telling really is about helping people have the courage because, you know, um, some of the people we were working with, whether it's in a school district or a city or county or some other organization, may not have felt that it was okay to tell their truth because there were there used, there were a lot of and there still are a lot of consequences mm -hmm. for telling your truth, especially yeah. at work. And so that 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 determination that people come before money, that is really guides a lot of what we do, and that that is one of the things that comes to me, creativity, I'm not, uh, not kind of cowering to the status quo. Yeah. And also really telling the truth at every touch point possible in ways that it can be heard. Yeah, no, that truth teller keeps coming up for you. And, and it's definitely something I, I see as a thread coming across mm -hmm. all your work. I, I do want to push in a little bit. And I know yeah. this may be a new question. But it's this notion that if you have these different identities of the marketer or the musician or the storyteller, are you able in this moment to, to think about a way a specific identity is sort of leaning in to that place that you said is the tension, like, wow, I'm really leaning mm. on the storyteller, oh. blending with the musician, and it's helping me wrestle with this thing differently. Yeah. Um, it's probably the curiosity mm -hmm. and the creative part of the it's the entrepreneur yeah. that makes me push yeah and it is the marketer that helps me get it done mm, fascinating mm -hmm. yeah. yeah it's i i likewise use a lot of storytelling and we don't have time to do it right now but when people are in the intersections it's unconscious and so i was catching you off guard a little bit mm -hmm. but using stories of what we're doing in our work and how we're doing it specifically, because the way you're using marketing is different than any other marketer I've ever met. Mm -hmm. And yet to get specific and detailed of what are the differences is hard to do off the top of our head. And yet that's where I'm finding the most hybridity is when we can get deeper into mm -hmm. the details. So we'll do that another time. I'll save okay. you <laughs> some time. I would love back. to. It's, it's very reflective is what I hear from people the most about the process of finding their hybridity. Wow, I've never self-examined this degree. <laughs> yeah. Never. Um, so tell me about what's next for you. So tell me a little bit more about like how, you know, the Black Female Project is going and you're consulting. Like, do you see them just continuing to grow and be bigger separately? Or like, how are you hoping to build? Ooh. these? So I do think they'll continue to grow, or at least this is what we're planning and what we yeah. see and anticipate is that they both will grow. But also that um, Black Female Project may be a funnel to oh. because um, it'll be a service for anyone who comes. Obviously, there's stories that people can access. And we talk about filling that story bank, um, yeah. podcast episodes, written stories, also yeah. a resource for Black women and other um, professionals who are seeking to learn from Black women's experience mm -hmm. to your point around intersectionality yeah. and the things that people um, have lenses on that add additional depth. Yeah. And and then the historical context of being a black woman and what's that, what the history of what that means. This is a snapshot in time of the black woman's work experience. Mm -hmm. So those resources. And then also for organizations, there are um, things, there are services that will be offered by Black Female Project, but also there are services around storytelling and also learning how to break through some of those MARCOM norms. Hmm. that that PGS consultants can support. 
There you go. And so as we start getting calls from organizations that just are really quite frank, like, oh my goodness, we have no diversity on our marketing team. And the question there then becomes, then how do you tell these stories? Yeah. And then when we get into coaching, the questions are there, like some people might come from a very linear or technical perspective and say, well, which word should I use instead of this one? Yeah. Uh, the question is, why did you pick that word in the first place? Mm-hmm. That's the work. Yeah. That's where the work gets done. What mm-hmm. what word what word comes out later? Like if it's true, right? Like let's get to what your truth is, and mm-hmm. then we get the work done. So I think there's going to be plenty of work for us to do. <laughs> um, and then there's also the undoing of the internalized pieces mm-hmm. of what's norm, what's normalized in workplaces, what's normalized for because Black Female Project is focused on how women have navigated racism and sexism in the workplace. So that conversation will continue. And our work is also a healing journey. So it's really, okay, so really like going back, it's really about my own healing journey. Uh, This is how it all started. And then learning how to use my voice. Surprise. mm. So that's why I'm so committed to it because I felt as a um, a professional that there were things I could not say Mm -hmm. or there were things that I saw that were not addressed and and people didn't take me seriously, whether it was because they didn't respect me because I was a young woman or they didn't respect me because they had never seen anyone who looked like me before. And so therefore leadership doesn't look like this. So you couldn't be I, I, I don't need to listen. Whereas um, I just definitely feel strongly that if we listen to young people in particular, the workplace, we would be a lot further faster. Mm. You are just blowing me away because you're talking about breaking down all these boxes and stereotypes and redefining the norm. And um, I love how you talked about your own healing journey and finding your voice. And then you chose it discipline of communications and marketing, which is a power platform of voice and what you're doing, the Black Female Project. I'm just seeing everything kind of do this with the different parts of yourself coming together as your own internal development, but also external to the world. This is, do you feel that? I'm just getting all I that. mean, I'm just watching and listening to you and taking <laughs> it in <laughs> because I could have never planned this. You know, mm-hmm. it, it just beautifully, mm-hmm. I'll tell you the way I chose my major. So I, you know, as you can imagine, it wasn't easy. Yeah. And um, I kept my minor in music, but I, I literally went through the catalog page by page. I was like, what class do I want to sit in? Like, what I are the classes? I, yeah. Because nothing of this seems interesting, really. Right. So I, um, I settled in the business school because of course, <laughs> that's what we were supposed to do at my phase of, you know, those were the messages I was getting like MBAs or everything. Not that they're not, right. I'm just saying. And then, um, but I did do an interdisciplinary um, focus area that combined mass communication, speech communications and marketing. Mm-hmm. So that gave me a little bit of diversity in yeah. what I was studying and every class wasn't, you know, in the business school and in quantitative methods or, you know, finance, not that those, those are important things, but it wasn't going to bring me joy every day. Yeah. To read those books. Let mm. me be clear. No, totally. Oh my gosh. There's just, I, I think what I learn about hybrids the most is they sort of end up there. It, it like can happen to them and they're not aware of like, oh yeah, I brought my background in this and my interest in that. And then suddenly the next thing I know, I've been this passion project that's a nonprofit. And how did I end up here? And that non-linearity is very typical because you're following mm-hmm. multiple interests and you do a little bit of this, but then, like you said, with the orchestra, I felt I was missing that. So then you go this way and there's this zigzag until you figure out the intersectionality. That is sort of like the missing piece. Mm-hmm. Personally, that's what I wasn't told in my own career path that I can blend and combine. I didn't have to choose just one. And you naturally, I think, gravitated and figured that out on your own too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to come back a little bit just because we're in a time of the world where, you know, Black Lives Matter. And as a white ally, do you have any tips on the work you're doing, how someone Mm -hmm. like me can support and be a better narrative change agent or storyteller? Mm -hmm. Ooh, I would say that's a first and foremost. Um, I appreciate you bringing it up and allowing space for that in the conversation Mm -hmm. today. And 
I loved that when I went to your site, I saw all kinds of people. Yeah. And when we talk about stories, you have a platform that's introducing mm-hmm. us to all kinds of people and their stories. So I don't know that I have anything additional to offer. I would say maybe for those who are listening who haven't engaged in a learning about people who don't look like them, yeah. like it sure makes life a little more, like it's more rich. It, and, and guess what? When you travel, you're a lot kinder because mm-hmm. <laughs> I have mm-hmm. traveled and seen people. I'm like, you do realize these people are human, right? Right. Like, <laughs> come with it. Like we are all sharing this planet. So um, I think the, the value of humanity has to be at the forefront and we all are deserving of our full humanity that Mm. literally when people say birthright, I'm like, why is it even a conversation? Like, was I born? (laughs) Then I'm human. And, um, but these stories that we hold on to, the narratives that we hold on to are perpetuated. So if you have friends in media, I'd say that's a place to start, right? Like how are we going to get more voices heard so that we have a better mix and balance of stories and truth and that we aren't always deferring to the, either the, the headline to make the sale. Yes. Or the narratives that hurt people. And we know it. Like, when do we decide Mm. we can be better? Oh, precious. You've just said amazing things. I'm just, I wish I was taking notes. I'm going to rewatch a lot of this. Um, You've got such a thoughtfulness to how you approach communication and, and really pushing people. And I can just feel that. And, you know, these audits people are probably asking you to do of like, how are we using this word? And you're like, why are you using that word? And just, oof, like pushing in is so good. Thank you. I, um, I think my last question to wrap us up is what if you learned about your identity today, the precious you are now Mm. that you wish you had known in younger years or earlier in your career, because you've gone through so much and look at where you've arrived that you didn't know you'd be at. I had no idea. And it was so clear, Mm. you know, that, that thing inside when you just know, Uh whether it's, you know, that's that's the partner or that's the job or it just was so clear to me. I was like, oh yeah, I'm out of here. Like, wow, I, we can count it down. <laughs> it was an ugly breakup with the job. Like it took six months to negotiate the transition. And in the midst of that, I was so clear, like, oh, mm-hmm. this is all gonna work out. And if it doesn't, guess what? Just go get a job. So um, I do wanna take a moment though to appreciate my parents. That's what's coming up for me as you ask that question. Um, who my mom was a teacher and an artist and a dancer. And my dad is a poet and a bus driver and a teacher and a, you know, a guy who studied and boxed and like all these different things. So I think in many ways it was modeled for me that, and I didn't know it. Yeah. And um, that feels really good in this moment of reflection that my mother also made space for all of us to be whomever we were. And we're all very different. I have four sisters. I grew up with three half sisters and a half brother. Wow. And we are all very different and all loved and um, doing well. And I really attribute that to my parents and extended family and blended family. Mm. That's a really nice sentiment. Yeah. To reflect on what were your role models and what did you feel growing up? So thanks for sharing that. The final thought on my mind is this notion of language, right? And the power, like you deal with that every day of looking at how we tell stories and what are the words. And I'm revealing this concept of hybrid professionals or hybrid professional identity. And that is a new language um, and concept that we didn't know or you didn't know. And I'm kind of bringing it to life. So language is such a powerful way to change behavior and narrative and all that. I've immensely enjoyed this conversation and I wanna make sure people can find you before we finish. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us, um, I'm gonna put up your link here. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so pjsconsultants.net, pjsconsultants.net. I'm also on LinkedIn at Precious Stroud. And also we are at Black Female Project on Instagram, Facebook, PJS Consultants on Instagram and Facebook. And you can always just email me at precious at blackfemaleproject.org. Perfect. And I will put those links in the post. This will go on YouTube as well. Um, I want to make sure people can find and follow you. Thank you. You bring so much to the world. And I've appreciated hearing more about this intersectionality that makes your work so rich and dynamic. That is, I think, what, what hybrids truly do. 
Any final things before we go, Precious? Thank you, Dr. Sarah Beth Burke. Thank I appreciate so being on and I appreciate the, the research that you're leading. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I, I just want people to be more of themselves, right? And not feel like they have to hide and compartmentalize or just choose one thing because those stories and narratives are broken and old too. So together we're on this mission and I just love that I got to meet you and that we were put together. So have a great day. And until next time, um, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Bye, Precious. Bye.